Hey everybody, so this morning we want to be talking about who are you. In fact, I want to talk about who are you, number one, and number two is what do you see? As we begin to look at a message today that is an encouragement and a challenge for both of all generations. That's for mums and dads, grandmas, grandpas, also for guys and girls. So I trust as you begin to prepare yourself for this message, the two things we're looking at is number one is who are you? And number two is what do you see? And that's the question I want to ask moms and dads first of all is what do you see when you see your children? What do you see? Do you see them just as normal or do you see them as somebody very special that God has got a plan and purpose for? And so let's turn our attention this morning to a a, a passage of scripture that is found in 1 Kings 18.21. It says, Elijah went before the people and asked the question, how long will you waver between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal is God, then follow him. And the Bible says, but the people said nothing. There seemed to be an identity crisis with the people as they were up on Mount Carmel, as they were being challenged by Elijah, as he was asking the questions, we need to know, are we for God or are we not? And then the second scripture I want to look at is found in 1 Corinthians 12, 6. The message version says this, Each person is given something to do that shows who God is, and everyone gets in on it, and everyone benefits. The last scripture I want to focus on is found in Mark chapter 16, verse 17 and 18. It says, And these signs shall follow them that believe. Now, you know, I'm an avid person when it comes to cameras. I, in fact, if I showed you, I have an, a, a, a lot of cameras in my home, different ages. In fact, I might just show you one or two of them as we're talking. Uh, some of them I've been given from friends. Um, others I've collected around the world as I've gone. Um, but one of the things we do notice that when you have a camera, and we've got different cameras, some have got very small lenses. For example, this is a very small little camera. Now, it's a Minolta 16. The thing with this little camera is that when you take the picture, it's going to be a very, very small picture. Um, other cameras, one of these, for example, is my little Kodak um, 124. It's an Instamatic. It doesn't take a great picture. It's a very grainy picture. But one of the things that makes uh, photography better is when you start taking lenses. And so I have a number of lenses. I've got this very small little uh, teleconverter lens over here. Um, we have this lens over here, which is a again a small lens. It can only do a certain amount of work. But as you go through lenses, and I've got different lenses. I'm going to show you some of them over here. Some of them are larger lenses. Now, this lens over here would do a much greater work and better work than, for example, the very small ones. Some of them are lenses that are created in order to focus in on a very minute detail. Uh, it would be micromanage or, or microfilm or micro uh, focus. And so it's focusing on very small. And what happens is when you focus on the small, everything else begins to blur into, uh, into the background. And so it's very possible for you to just focus in on one area. Here's what the, a, a statesman, uh, Frederick Douglass, said. It's easier to build strong children than it is to repair men. Now, I'm sure in your church, as in many churches around the world, you have a thing called baby dedication. There'll be times when mums and dads will get out there, they'll bring their little treasures, those that are born, uh, some of them are a few months old, some maybe a few years old. But at a baby dedication, for some people, it's a wasted hour. Well, what am I going to church for? What am I going to go and sit there as we just give over a child? But I think there's something important as we, as we look at a baby dedication. One of the things is that we're making promises as a parent before God that we want to train up our children the way they should go. The other thing that happens when we do a baby dedication, I think this is the important point, is that these children are not ours, but they're on loan from God to us. And in fact, what happens is they're just borrowed. And what we are wanting is, I want to say today that when these children come into our world and they come into our homes and come into our lives, a baby dedication reminds us that they come packaged with everything that they are created for on their mission that they're going to be on the world. And so as a parent, 
As a grandparent, you're making promises before God at a baby dedication not to, uh, uh, to mold those children into something that you would like, but to rather unfold what God has packaged in them. And that's exactly what we want to talk about. There's always been asked the question, is it nurture or nature? Uh, can I say that if we leave our children to nature, we will lose them. We have to nurture faith. We have to nurture because the battle for our children is for their minds and hearts. It's a battle that's taking place right now for the minds and hearts as worldviews and cultures are focusing on having your children's attention, having your young people's attention. They want to take them. And so I want to ask you the question. I want you to look at your hands right now as moms and dads, as, as adults, as grandparents. I want you to look at your hands right now and I want you to say this. The eternities of my children and my grandchildren are in my hands. The eternities of my children and my grandchildren are in my hands. And so today I want to look at a different focus. I want us to look at our children through different eyes. I want you to see your children through different eyes. And uh, I want you just for a, an object lesson maybe is to show you, you know, sometimes we can look at our children. These are just straws from one of our local uh, fast foods. You'll probably recognize them if you can still get them. But you know, when I look at these straws, they're all the same. They come out the same shape. They come out the same size. But I want you to look differently today. Here's another straw. And I want you to see the difference between that straw and these straws. Are your children just like everybody else's children? Do you see them as everybody else's children? Or are you going to see them through different eyes? You know, God's got a better picture for your children. And that's what I want to talk about today. You see, you can look at your children and say, well, they're just like everybody else. You can treat them like everybody else, see them through the lens of every other child, or you can begin to see them through a different picture. You see, when I'm doing this right now, I'm explaining to you that your children have got spiritual capacity. I want to talk about a little later on. They have capacity for God that's beyond anything that we can think or imagine, but it has to be nurtured. And so as I'm talking about this, this straw, uh, I want you to see, in fact, uh, my room is not big enough, but I might just put it to the side. As you can see, it's a huge straw compared to the small ones. Can I tell you today that God's got a better picture? God's got something very different that He wants you to see. He wants you to see your children through expectation. He wants you to see them through encouragement. He wants you to see them through nurture. And, and when we start creating the language... Uh, and, and for, for that, that, that atmosphere, we are starting to expand what we can believe that our kids can do for God. You see, God's got some powerful things He wants to happen in our lives. There's very powerful things He wants to see happen in your children's life. And so there's two words I want to focus in on today. It's this word identity and purpose. Identity and purpose. You see, when I talk about um, what we speak over our children, your words have got powerful your words have got power. All of our words have got power. You know, uh, maybe as a, as a child and maybe guys and girls, when I think about you at school, have you ever heard that statement? Sticks and stones will break my bones, but words will never harm me. Can I tell you that that's not true? That words have got the power to harm us. Words have got the power to, to create dangers in our lives. Words have got the power to destroy us. In fact, the Bible uses a scripture that says, the power of life and death is in the tongue. Our words have got the power of life and death. You know, for some of you at school, maybe you've had the power of words spoken of you, uh, mean stinks, where, where, where people have, have um, what's the word I'm looking for? They have, they've come to you and they've said things. Maybe, maybe as you look it up here, it's through social media. You've experienced bullying as people have spoken words. You go to school and all of a sudden your name is all over the place, not for good reasons, but for bad reasons. Can I say that most of those people have never spoken to you? Maybe they've never heard you speak. They, they're just speaking from something that they've read about on social media. And so the danger is there. You see, our words have got the power to either heal hearts or break hearts. Our words have got the power to build or to break. They have the power to build up. They have the power to break. Your words as a parent have the power to heal and to hurt. Your, power, your words have the power to build or to break. Your words have the power to build bridges or barriers. Depending on how we word, use our words, 26 letters of an alphabet put together can either become words of life or words of destruction. Your words have got the power to give somebody wings or weights, depending how you use them. 
These words that I'm speaking about today are words that we speak over ourselves. Think about some of the words you speak about over yourselves. Words like, I can't, uh, I'm not trustworthy, uh, I, I must be perfect. You've heard somebody say that I'm a mistake. And so you're using these words over yourselves. Maybe they're not just the words that you speak of yourself, but the words that others are speaking of you. These could be the words that a parent has spoken. And I'm speaking not just to boys and girls that are in, in their teenage years or younger today, but even moms and dads. You could have had words spoken over you by your parents, your grandparents that are still haunting you today. You see, your destiny is connected to your identity. Your destiny is connected to your identity. We can let language and labels be put upon us. Think about some of the labels that we put on people. You, you might have told, uh, you might have said to your child, you know, you're just stupid. And so what happens is that child is now wearing the label, I'm stupid. Uh, you, you might have said, you're hopeless. You're not like your brother. And so what happens is we're wearing the labels. And I could go on and on just putting labels. Think about the labels we put on people. Think about the labels you put on your children. Think about the labels you speak of your, your, your parents. So your labels have become your language and your language then becomes your limitations. I want to say today that every single one of us of all ages have got three pictures that are about our lives. There's three pictures that are for your life. Everyone has three pictures. One of the pictures is the picture that you have of yourself. When you look in the mirror, who do you see? When you speak about yourself, what do you say? You have a picture about yourself that you are sharing every single day. The second picture is the picture that others have about you. And the third one is the picture that God has about you. You see, the first one is maybe you see yourself as a loser. Maybe you see yourself as hopeless and helpless. Maybe you see yourself as a failure or unloved. And so you keep on using these words. I'm not good enough. Uh, I, I could never be like my sister. I could never be like my brother. Those are the words that you speak. That's the picture you see about yourself. I, I, I'm just a drama queen. All I do is fail. The second picture could be the picture that others have spoken over you. In fact, what I'm saying there is this is, hello, I am whatever you label me. And so we have this picture that, that we're speaking. In fact, some of the words you're speaking over your own life are words that others are now speaking over you. The words that they're speaking have become your language. And that therefore, they become your limitation. You, you may have pictures placed on you as a loser because others are now saying those same things about you. Those bullies are using the words and you've believed the words that the bullies have said. You've believed the words and the expectations that others have put upon you. You'll never be like or you'll never do like. And so you're living with those expectations. And so in the process, of what others are saying, you've just blended in. You started blending in and just to be part of the crowd rather than, than, than be the person that God created, you've now become what everybody else wants you to become. You, you become like them, you think like them, you act like them and you speak like them. And so you're no longer the, the unique person that God has created. What you have become is a clone. You've become a carbon copy. You've become a replica. You've become molded. Remember we talked about molding and unfolding at a baby dedication. What you've done is you've allowed others to mold you into somebody that you're really not. And so you've become a duplicate. For some of us, we've lived this picture for so long that we've now become believing it. And even as adults, you may be believing those pictures. In fact, what we've done is we've missed the picture that God has for us. And as a result of missing that picture, we've now become the carbon copy of other people. Can I say today that when you get your identity wrong, it's very easy for everyone else um, to become or to become what everyone else wants you to become. You know, there's a wonderful picture. There's the picture you've got. There's the picture others have got. But there's also the picture that God has for you. And I want to say today that God's got the preferred picture. In fact, that word vision it simply means a preferred picture. God's got a better picture for you. And that's what I want to talk about. I believe that the picture that God has got for you is bigger and better than the one you've got for yourself. The picture that God's got for you is bigger and better than any picture that somebody else has got for you. Somebody else trying to put their expectations upon you. 
God's got the bigger and better picture. In fact, not just the bigger and better, He's got the best picture. I want you to turn to your, your children right now, mom and dad, and say, God's got the best picture for you. Boys and girls, I want you to turn to your moms and dads and say, God's got the best picture for you. God has always got the best picture. So He's got the bigger picture, He's got the better picture, and He's also got the best picture. And what is God's picture for us? You see, God's got a purpose for your life. God's got a purpose for your life as a mother and father. God's got a purpose for your life. You, you may not have lived the purposes of God, but God is saying today, I've got purpose for your life. It says there in Isaiah 43, 7, Everyone who is called by, by my name and whom I have created for my glory, whom I have formed, even whom I have made. You were made for the glory of God. You were made to carry the glory of God. And when we understand God's purposes for our lives, things begin to change. You see, we've got the choice of either being the unique person that God has created or become the duplicate that everybody else wants. You see, you and I are not just created to take up space, but we are created to be an original. Now, what is an original? It's somebody who is unique. It's somebody who is exclusive. There's a one of a kind. There's nobody else on the planet like you. You have unique fingerprints. You have a uniqueness that God created for you for. We found out in the first scripture, second scripture we read in 1 Corinthians 12, 6. Each person is given something to do to show who God is. You have got a something that you were created for to be put on this earth for. You are not just taking up space. You are not a mistake, but you are created for a purpose. You are a one of a kind. You are uncommon. In fact, you are authentic. There is a soul edition. There is no other edition on the planet like you. And of course, you are also a limited edition. Do you remember the movie uh, Lion King? Now, I know there's a Lion King 1 and Lion King 2, and I think they're very similar, just that they've updated uh, in, in what they've used and to create it to be more lifelike. But I want you to remember in the picture and in the story, when, when Simba is looking into a, a water well and he sees the reflection of his father, Mafusa, and he hears the words of his father speak to him, and these are the words he says to him. He says, you have forgotten me. He is telling Simba, Simba, you have forgotten me. And Simba says, no way, father, I could never forget you. How can I forget you? He says, you have forgotten who you are. Therefore, you have forgotten me. You have forgotten who you are. Therefore, you have forgotten me. Can I say the same is true for us today? When we forget who we are, we forget who God is. And we forget who God says we are. We have to have the right identity. We have to have the right picture. Because when we have the wrong picture and we're listening to the wrong voices and, we, and, and we're living by the, right, the wrong labels and, and we're looking for treasure in the wrong places, we're never going to do the things that God has planned for our lives. You see, when we have wrong identity, we live wrong, we act wrong, and we also believe wrong. But I want you to know today, that God's got a plan and a purpose for you. And so I want to talk about these two words, identity and purpose, and they are both connected. Identity answers the question of who am I? And purpose answers the question, why do I exist? Because if you don't know who you are, you don't know why you exist. And if you don't know who you are, you don't know what the plans are for your life. And if you don't know who you are, you're not going to do the things that you were created for. You are not a mistake, but you are born on purpose for a purpose. And so I want to talk about purpose for a few moments. There's a few screenshots going to come up right now, a few slides. And on these slides, I'm going to ask you, what is the purpose of this thing? Now, I wish I was there in front of you to get your reactions. I wish I could hear your words speaking. But as I go through them, I want you to maybe just for a few seconds, turn around to your family members and say what you think this is. What would you use this for? Number one, what is the purpose of this thing? If I were to give you this, what would you use it for? Now, I can tell you that uh, I have, uh, uh, for many times when I've used these examples, I've had many ideas being given. For example, somebody might have said to me, well, this is a, a thing that you use to, to take gra uh, grass or to take soil and to push soil around. 
Uh, but can I tell you, that's not the purpose of it. You can use it for those things, but that's not the purpose. The purpose of it, it's an infant food pusher. It's something that was used many, many years ago. And what they would do is uh, when the food was in the baby's mouth, they would use this infant food pusher to push the food down, not down the throat, but push it into the mouth. Wow, well, it didn't sound very good, does it? All right, what about this? If I gave you one of these, what would you use it for? Now, again, I can tell you that there have been people that have said to me, well, that's a, like a water thing. It's a, you could use it for water. It's a vase. Uh, it's a great thing that you could use it for. It could be repurposed for those things, but that wasn't the reason it was created. What was this? It was a ceramic feeding bottle for babies. Just like we get the plastic bottles nowadays, this was a ceramic feeding bottle. First of all, we've got the infant food pusher, which is, it's feel, it looks like a, a, a weapon of torture. And then we've got a ceramic feeding bottle. You could use it for a vase, but that's not the purpose of it. What about this? <laughs> what would you use this for? Now, I can tell you that I've had many, many ideas being given to me about this one. But as you look at that, what would you use that for? Now, somebody might have suggested, well, listen, this is a thing that you comb your hair with. And I said, that sounds a wonderful idea, except that these things could probably draw blood from your head because that's not the purpose of it. This is what the purpose is. It's a tea cake pricker. And as you can see, what it would do, it would prick the holes into a, into a tea cake. And that was it. Nowadays, we have, uh, we have computers that do these things. We have, we have uh, things that are, that are electronically designed to do these things. But in the old days, many years ago, maybe your grandmother or great-grandmother would have used one of these. It was a way of making holes into a, uh, into a tea cake. So can you see purpose? Here's the, here's the important thing. When you get purpose wrong, it's easy to misuse and abuse. Now, I have, this is a place that I want to go to. It's on my, my bucket list to go here one day. It's called the Mojave Desert. And when you go to the Mojave Desert, you're going to see all lying out in the desert are thousands upon thousands upon thousands of different airplanes. Some of them are the 747. Some of them are the newest ones. In fact, right now with the pandemic, uh, we have, uh, Qantas has taken their planes into the Mojave Desert and other deserts around the world. Singapore Airlines have brought their planes into the Australian deserts because it's a place where rust doesn't get these aircrafts. But here's the thing. What is the purpose? If these planes could speak as they lined up in the desert, if they could speak a voice, I wonder what they would say. I think one of the things they would say is, what in the world are we doing in a desert? Because what is the purpose of an aeroplane? What do you say the purpose of an aeroplane is? That's right. It's not to sit in a desert, but it's to fly in the skies. So we know that these are the purposes of, of a plane. The plane is meant to fly in the sky, but instead of flying in the sky, what is it doing? It's lying in a desert. These planes will be saying, this is not the purpose we were created for. We are meant to take people around the world. We're meant to take dignities and royalty. We're meant to take people from, from one destination to another. But instead, we're sitting in a desert. It was never created to sit in deserts. Here's another one. What's the purpose of a chair? Of course, a chair, the purpose of a chair is that we'd sit in it. Uh, you could be sitting on right now. What's the purpose of a ball? That's right. The purpose of a ball is not to sit on it, but it's to kick it around. I think the person who created the ball must have seen children many, many years ago kicking stones around and maybe their feet are bleeding. And so he said, no, this is not what they're created for. They are created. Uh, and I, I want to give them something that they could enjoy. And so he creates the thing called the ball. The person who created the chair had a different purpose. He thought about you. He might have thought about you sitting at school, boys and girls. He might have thought about you sitting at an office, mom or dad. He might have thought about you sitting in church. And so instead of sitting on a hard floor, you, he would say, let me create something that a person can enjoy and they wouldn't get hurt. And so he created the chair. Now, here's what I want to ask. The purpose of the chair and the purpose of the ball are two different things. Both have purpose, but they have different purpose. What would happen if I went to your school one day and said to all the boys and girls, hey guys and girls, let's have a good game of soccer. 
I want you to come on the field and hey, you like soccer? Come out and everybody comes running out. We want to play a game of soccer, but instead of finding a soccer ball, you found a chair. And I say to you, there it is, kick it around. What would you look at me? You'd say, what? Are you crazy? Why would I kick a chair around? Because it's not created for that. Yes, I could kick a chair around, but it wouldn't be the same. I wouldn't get the same pleasure out of it. Can I tell you that when you don't know your purpose, you can misuse yourself. When moms and dads don't know the purpose of their children, very easy for us to get sidetracked. So instead of unfolding what God has placed in us, we now begin to mold them. Here's what I want to say today. God's purpose is very simple. It's to know Him and to show Him. To know Him and to show Him. He's saying to you today, I want you to know me and I want you to show me. Show me to your friends. Show me to your neighborhood. Show me to your school. Show me to people around. And we'll find out in a few moments how to do that. God's purpose is not that we mold our children. God's purpose is not that you get molded by your friends, but you unfold what God has placed inside you. 1 Corinthians 12, 6 in the message says, each person is given something. God wants you to unfold the something that is unique to you. He wants you to unfold it. Because he says, you are not just created to live on this planet, but you are created for the supernatural. You are created to connect heaven to earth. You are created to bring God's presence into your realm. You are created to take God's presence, to know Him and to show Him. You see, the, the, the main street of the Bible is a supernatural God uh, doing supernatural things. When I look at the Bible, I see this miraculous God. I see this miraculous, incredible, uh, majestic God doing incredible things. And he says to you, I don't want to just do them out there, but I want you to be part of the plan. I want you to be part of the purpose. We see this in the life of Jesus. One of the keys of the kingdom is touching heaven, touching earth. We see it in the life of Jesus. How did Jesus do it? Wherever he went, he took the presence of, of his father. He said, I only say what I hear my father say, and I only do what I see my father do. He was touching heaven, touching earth. The Bible says, when, when they ask Jesus, how do we pray? He says, pray this, that, my, that, that the, uh, the will of, of Father of heaven would be also the will on earth. That God's will and God's kingdom will be on earth just as it is in heaven. He's saying to us today, I want you to be like Jesus and do like Jesus. If you want to know what the, the, the will of the Father is, look at the life of Jesus. What did Jesus do? He did the supernatural. He took the presence of God. Everywhere he went, he did signs and wonders. He seemed saying to you today, you and I are created to be like Jesus and to do like Jesus. Not just boys and girls, but moms and dads as well. Grandmas, grandpas, every generation to be like Jesus and to do like Jesus. You see, I believe today that you are created to be the containers of God's presence and power. I believe that you are created to be the carriers of God's presence and power. And not just the carriers, but also the connectors that where you go, you touch heaven, you touch earth. So that wherever you go, God goes. I want to encourage you today that God wants to awaken some stuff in you today as boys and girls. He wants you to know that you've got a plan and purpose. He wants moms and dads to know that your boys and girls can do in signs and wonders. They can do supernatural things, but they need people that will encourage them and equip them and nurture them in their faith. So what are we looking? God wants you to awaken that He wants that you're created to hang out with Him. He wants you to know that He wants to do stuff in you and through you. He wants you to know because of who you are, you are created to hang out with God. Adam and Eve hung out with God every day. We are created to have fellowship and to be in relationship with God. Know Him and then show Him. You are created to be the living space of God. You are His habitation, the scripture says. You are his living space, his building. And because you are his building, you are there to carry God's presence and power. You are created to carry his light into the world. The Bible says that you are the light and the salt. So wherever you go, you change atmospheres. Wherever you go, you change things around you. It happens because you are carrying the presence and the power of God. You are also created to be a doorway of heaven on earth. That's what God is asking you today. Are you willing to be that? Now I'm going to show you a few pictures and I'm going to ask you, what do you see when you see these pictures? What do you see when you look at this picture here? 
what do you see? Moms and dads, what do you see? Boys and girls, what do you see? I tell you what I see. I see young boys and girls who are in the presence of God, under the presence of God, under the touch of God, worshippers of God. You see, moms and dads, your boys and girls can be incredible worshippers, warriors and witnesses for the king, just like you can be. I ask you, what do you see as you look at the next one? What do you see over here? I tell you what I see. I see young boys and girls laying hands on the sick. Now, I know this is true because this happened in, in our ministry when we taught kids how to pray for the sick for 13 weeks. And then as we shared a message in the adult congregation, we had kids lay hands on the sick and God did signs and wonders. What do you see? I see children. What do you see? This is the same. Here they are, intensely praying, believing as they laid hands on the sick. They're saying, God, will you use me as I lay hands on the sick? What do you see? I see young girls and boys alive in the presence of God. I see them worshiping God. You see, you were created to be a worshiper. You are created to be a warrior in the kingdom. You're created to be a witness of the signs and wonders and supernatural. What do you see over here? I see little ones, little ones, little ones, young ones, lost in the presence of God, worshiping God. God is saying to you today, I want to see the same in your life. Go heal the sick. God says, I want you to do the same. What do you see? I see a young boy lost in the presence of God, lying on the floor, encountering God. Boys and girls, you can encounter God. Moms and dads, your children can encounter God. Here's a young boy, Esteban. I'll tell you his story as we come to a close in a moment. Esteban's 11 years of age. He's in Mexico. I personally don't know Esteban, but I know people who know him and his family. He's lying in the hospital. He's had an emergency appendix operation. And in the process of lying in the bed there, his parents are there that day. He hears this commotion two or three doors down another ward. There's, and they find out there's a young couple who have lost their baby. The little baby is dead and it's been taken down to the mortuary in the hospital. Esteban's 11 years of age. He's lying in his bed and he hears God speak to him. Do you believe that God can speak to 11-year-olds? Do you believe that God can speak to 10-year-olds? I do. He hears God speak, and this is what God says to Esteban. Esteban, I want you to go and raise that baby from the dead. Whoa. Can you imagine as he, speaks, he turns to his mom and dad and says, Mom and dad, God's just told me he wants me to go and pray that this baby comes back to life. That mom and dad were like, whoa, hey, hey, whoa, 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 whoa. Esteban, Esteban, let's rather pray for mom and dad because they are very, very sad right now. And he said, no, God said, I want to go and raise that baby from the dead. So they go to the authorities of the hospital. And as they go to the authorities, and this is explained to him, this is, they said, no, 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 you're not going in the mortuary. Well, Esteban heard from God, and so he goes down to the mortuary. At the mortuary, they won't open the door, but there's a window in the door he can see in. And so what he does, he stands on the outside, and he commands, he shouts, Baby, I command you in the name of Jesus, come back to life. And he goes back to his bed. Within 30 minutes, turn to your neighbor, turn to your family and say, 30 minutes. The nurses are running up and down the, the aisles and they are screaming, they're shouting, the baby's alive, the baby's alive. What happened? Esteban, 11 years of age, heard God speak. He believed what God said and he acted upon it. Can I tell you that God wants to do the same with you? It didn't just happen with Esteban in Mexico. He has a group of kids in Kenya. What happened is, again, they were taught that God can heal the sick and he wants to heal the sick. So they found out, they said, where's the place where most people are sick? They found the local hospital and they began to go from the top ward down. And as they prayed ward by ward, every single person on those wards were healed. And as they were healed, what happened? The, the superintendent said, who is this God that you're praying to that is closing down my wards and my hospital? Can I tell you, moms and dads, can I tell you, boys and girls, God wants to do the same thing for you. Why? Because you can say today, I am who God says I am, and I can do what God says I can do. God is saying to you today, will you believe it? Will you believe it today? Why? Because you and I are created to be live links from heaven to earth. Wherever you go, you take the presence of God. You take the power of God. And as we found in the scripture, 
in Mark chapter 16, 17, 18, these signs shall follow them that believe. Do you believe that God says to you today, I've got a better picture for your life? Do you believe that God says today that you are not who others say you are, but you are who I say you are? And I believe today that God is saying to you today, will you just believe? He says, each person is given something to do. 1 Corinthians 12, 6. Something to do to show who God is. Who is God? You know who God is? He's the great I am. He's not yesterday's God. He's not tomorrow's God. He's the God today. I am that I am. And I want to tell you today, God is alive. God is supernatural. God is a healer. God is deliverer. God is omnipresent. God is, is, is omniscient. He's all-knowing and He's all-powerful. And that God is saying to you today, I want you to carry me to your friends. I want you to carry me to your neighborhood. I want you to carry me wherever you go so that other people will be able to see you. And let me close with this today. Boys and girls, you do not receive a junior Holy Spirit because you don't fight junior devils. You receive the same Holy Spirit that mom and dad have received. You receive the same Holy Spirit that adults receive and you receive the same power. So I want to encourage you today that I'm asking the questions, how do you see yourself? Do you see yourself through God's picture or are you seeing yourself through somebody else's eyes? Moms and dads, how do you see your children today? How do you see yourself? I want to pray today for you today because I believe that God wants to do some fresh things in your life. God wants to do some fresh things in your family. God wants to touch every single generation today. And he's looking, all he's saying today is, I'm looking for a yes heart. Are you willing to say, God, yes, I take what you say about me. I believe what you say about me. And I want to do what you say I can do. I want to do those things. These signs will follow them that believe. I believe. And therefore, I say yes. Let's pray together. Father God, I want to thank you for every mom and dad, grandma, grandpa, every boy and girl right now. I pray that, Lord, as we've looked at these slides, as we've shared this message, that, Lord God, we would believe that you have a better picture for us, that you have got purpose. That, Lord, uh, we are not who others say we are, but we are who you say we are. And so, Father, today I pray for every boy and girl. I pray that you would anoint them. I pray that, Lord, they would have a hunger in their spirit, a hunger in their hearts to do the things that Jesus did, that we will be like and do like Jesus. I pray for moms and dads today. I pray that, Lord, as we look at our boys and girls, we will not see them as it was a few moments ago, those just like everybody else straws, but we'll see them as mighty in the presence of God, mighty in the things of God. And so, Lord, I pray that moms and dads and grandmas and grandpas and, and, and spiritual mothers and fathers and leaders will get around this generation and say, God, we want to see a generation rise up who will do the mighty things of God. So I bless Every single boy and girl that is hearing this message, every mother and father, every grandma, every grandfather, every single leader, I pray for every uh, spiritual mother and father today. Lord God, help us that, Lord, we will take this next generation on a journey that will see the mighty things of God come to pass in their life. In Jesus' name I ask it, and we say amen. God bless. God bless you, families. Thank you so much for sharing this message with me. I trust that in the future we'll see each other face to face. God bless and God bless your family. Amen.